A few weeks ago, I spoke at an event where I was asked to talk about some really important experiences uh, from my life in front of about 100 strangers. I talked about things like how in 2014 I miscarried my second child, how my dad died five days later, and how my husband died six weeks after that. The point of my talk was about owning your own story and not letting other people define you by what they think your life is like. When it was over, everyone clapped, and there was some time for Q&A, and a woman's hand shot up. She wanted to know if I was pregnant. The room was silent, and I acted like I'm Angelina Jolie, and I said, next question. Looking back at this now, there's a lot of things I could say about it. Like, I know it was asked from a good place, but why are women asked that? Like, if you want to tell a hundred strangers, you tell a hundred strangers. Um, or even the irony of having a stranger demand a story told about me when I just talk for an hour about personal narrative. Instead, I'll tell you that, yeah, I was pregnant with a baby I had last week. And I didn't want to talk about it with a hundred strangers or even a hundred of my friends. I didn't want to talk about it with anyone. I'm in love with two men. I now have a child by each of them. This is the storyline for 90% of Maury Povich episodes, and I know what you're thinking. Who is this irresponsible woman, and hasn't she heard of birth control? I'm Nora McInerney. And I have heard of birth control. This is terrible. Thanks for asking. Or it it will be next week. This week is a big week. So big that I didn't want to let it pass by without acknowledging it. For most people, it's just Thanksgiving in America. And for me... For me, it's two years ago this week that my husband Aaron died of brain cancer. When it happened, I was beyond sad or devastated. I was feeling things that don't even have words, and sometimes feeling nothing at all because depression. But I was not completely insane, and I knew that, like annoying people like to say, the world would keep spinning, the sun would shine again, it's always darkest before the dawn, and any other astrological or meteorological phrase that people like to throw around when bad things happen. I knew that I would love again. I knew this in part because also people like to say that too. At Aaron's funeral, more than one person reassured me that at 31, I was still young, still beautiful, and would find someone else. I knew that was true, but I didn't know how hard it would be. Not the finding someone part. That was actually kind of easy. My friend Mo, who's also a widow, had some friends over and one of them was cute and shy and dorky and fell out of his chair trying to introduce himself. We stayed up all night, by that I mean 10 p.m., talking to me about his divorce and my dead husband and both our hearts were like, hey, you're great, let's do this. So, finding someone, that was easy. Falling in love, also pretty easy. I thought for sure I'd take it slow. I'd never dated as a widowed mother, but I knew one thing for certain. My nearly three-year-old son and I were a team, a unit. Nobody, nobody was ever meeting Ralph. Mr. Hart met Ralph a few weeks after we met, and it wasn't in a, hi, here's your new dad kind of way, but in the way Ralph had met so many other adults during his tumultuous little life, where his father was sick and dying from the day he was born. It was, hey, this is a guy I know, that kind of thing. And Ralph treated Mr. Hart like any other person he'd met a few times before. He offered him goldfish crackers. He bossed him around. He asked him to wipe his butt for him after he pooped. Being in love brings you a certain measure of happiness. I think for most people it's actually a lot of happiness, but I'm not most people. 
I'm a people who lost her husband, who wrote a book about it, who started a sort of tongue-in-cheek but actually very real Hot Young Widows Club, who spent almost a full year in complete shock and denial before realizing she was drowning in an ocean of anxiety, depression, and grief. Happiness, to me, was only acceptable in small increments. I could have a little at a time, just not too much. I never knew, really, what grief looked like. We're very, very good at hiding it, compartmentalizing it, experiencing it in private, mostly. You are, of course, allowed to actively grieve during a wake, a funeral, a burial. Perhaps you can keen over your husband's dead body, post a few sad status updates, write a blog post. But did you know that grief isn't just crying? That grief isn't just like a facial expression or a physical act? Did you know that a grieving person can do a lot of things like laugh and go to movies and grocery shop and raise a child all while bleeding to death internally? Well, now you know, so you won't be surprised when it happens to you. That grief, that sneaky, stalkery, internal bleeding kind of grief can't be posted to Instagram. It can't be performed on cue when you run into former friends who have evaporated from your life or acquaintances you recognize from the internet. People are always telling me how much they appreciated my honesty and transparency, and I would think, why? Not because I was lying about anything, but because even if I were made of saran wrap and glass, there's no way you can see this part. Grief was my constant companion, and I didn't totally hate it either, and I still don't. It's a bruise I get to push, a pain that reminds me that what I had and what I lost is real. It's the price I paid for loving deeply and for letting myself be loved. It's the evidence that Aaron was here and that he's really gone. Falling in love didn't take my grief away, and it didn't diminish it at all. My grief just scooted over a little bit to make room for Mr. Hart. It invited him and our relationship to live in my heart at the same time. But happiness, love, is so much easier to demonstrate than grief. They're so much easier to see. And something about that made me really uncomfortable. (sighs) Maybe I was afraid of the judgment of others. But mostly, I think I feared my own judgment. That loving another person would somehow diminish what I had with my dead husband, Aaron. That if I was happy, I must not be sad anymore. That if I wasn't sad anymore, I must not have loved him. That I didn't actually deserve to be happy again. I fell in love with Mr. Hart without falling out of love with Aaron. Aaron didn't leave a space to fill. There's no replacing something that big, not in any way. And adding something new and good to your life doesn't erase anything. If it did, then compulsive shoppers and hoarders would have the key to happiness, and we wouldn't have so many reality shows about them. Which would also be sad because I really like those shows. Before my husband died, I lost our second baby. We were right at that magical 12-week mark, you know, where you're officially a okay nothing bad can happen. But the baby died anyway, maybe a few days before, maybe weeks. Either way, while my husband and father lay dying on opposite sides of the city, eaten alive by cancers their own bodies had created, I closed my eyes in a hospital room telling an anesthesiologist about my manicure, and when I woke up, I was not pregnant anymore. And I was worried I'd given her the wrong name for my nail polish. An entire universe... A whole human life had bloomed and withered inside of me without anyone but our family knowing. And I didn't have time to weep for it. My dad would die five days later. And Aaron, six weeks after that. 
Mr. Hart knew all of this. He'd heard bits and pieces from Mo, and then from me. And then I sent him the manuscript to my memoir of grief and love before we got serious, like a little bit of a warning for him, so he could fully understand the levels of fucked up I was and make an informed decision. He had untangled himself from a gnarly marriage. His experience was years of stress and betrayal and layers of pain. Things I couldn't understand going through at the hands of someone who had promised to love and cherish you or make you pancakes. He wasn't scared by any of it. But I was. Three months after we met, I was alone when I took the pregnancy test. We talked about babies, of course, in those far-off ways you talk about things when you're newly in love, like, when will we get married? Well, probably a year or so. Should we have another baby? Duh. And soon, because he's almost 40, and who knows how long it would take me. My body had never really recovered from that miscarriage. My set-your-clock-to-it period had disappeared since my DNC procedure the year before. Pregnancy seemed like a dream or an impossibility. I woke up one day, bewildered on my sofa where I'd been writing. It was 1 p.m. I'd been asleep for, what, 30 minutes? An hour? Either way, a nap was out of character for me. But I felt that dark, velvet of sleep wrapping around me again and decided to make it a double. When I woke up again, I drove to Walgreens where I made another uncharacteristic choice and went with the store brand pregnancy tests. That second line showed up immediately as I peed. It was dark pink, and I smiled to myself, holding a small piece of plastic soaked in my urine. Holy shit, I said to only me, and I watched myself smile in the mirror. When I told Aaron I was pregnant with Ralph four years earlier, he wept and we slow danced in our living room together. He had stage four brain cancer, but we knew this baby would keep him alive. We took baby classes together. We told our friends and family in small, intimate groups. We posted photos of my belly online. This baby's pregnancy has been between me, Mr. Hart, a few friends, our families, and my manicurist. I'm six feet tall, slightly asocial. and For the most part, as a pregnant woman, I just look like I did freshman year of college when I discovered there was unlimited ice cream in the cafeteria. If people noticed, they usually didn't ask me, and I only told the people I wanted to tell when I wanted to tell them. I've told myself a lot of things about this. The writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, whose name I've practiced so many times, and pray I am saying correctly, gave an interview after having a baby nobody knew she was pregnant with and told people she didn't believe women should be forced to perform their pregnancies. At the time, I was thinking about how I would announce my pregnancy to my social media following, and I thought, you know what, you're right. Because we shouldn't have to. But mostly, I wasn't concerned about performing pregnancy. I didn't want to perform love and happiness and grief. This emotional stew I was cooking inside of me. Have you seen stew? It's disgusting to look at, no matter what it tastes like. When I was 17 weeks along, we told all our kids about the baby. Mr. Hart's kids are 15 and 10, and they were excited and probably a little weirded out because they're old enough to know what sex is and that their dad had it with me and (laughs) you. Ralph is three, and he immediately asked when he would have a baby. We made it all about him and his pregnancy. Rude. It was the Friday before Memorial Day, and we were this happy, weird little family unit coming together. Three days later, on Memorial Day, I woke up early to go to the co-op and get everyone breakfast and donuts and coffee, and suddenly I was in a bloodbath. The baby was gone. I was miscarrying. I left my basket on the floor of the store and drove home, ran up the stairs to my room, and texted Mr. Hart to act casual and stay with the kids. I'm having a miscarriage and will take myself to the hospital. I texted him that. 
And then I called my mother and sobbed. My friend Mo drove across town to pick me up and take me to the same ER where Aaron had been told that he was really, truly dying. Mo sat with me for six hours while we waited for a doctor and an ultrasound tech, and I wept and wept and wept. I'd killed the baby with apathy by not being truly 100% excited for it, by wondering how it would affect my career, how it would affect how people saw me and my relationship to Aaron. I had my mother tell everyone who knew about the pregnancy that my baby was dead. When they wheeled my bed down that same hallway Aaron had been wheeled down so many times, and the ultrasound tech said, oh, baby's fine. I swore I would be different. I would be happy and grateful for this miracle I never thought I'd get to experience again. But I wasn't. I didn't buy any clothes or tiny shoes. I didn't sign up for baby classes. I didn't think about cute baby announcements or baby showers. Barely took the vitamins. I just pretended that life was going on as usual, but with more heartburn and bigger pants. Some people I know are like, well, that's just a second baby for you. But those are people whose husbands and babies' fathers are still alive. People who know about the new baby are happy for me. But that's not the issue. The issue is, can I be happy for me? A boyfriend, which I've written about, is one thing. But a baby is a family, My family was me and Aaron and Ralph, and now my family is me and Aaron and Ralph and Mr. Hart and his kids and this baby. Two years ago, my family was falling apart. Today, my family is stitched together from a lot of broken places. I hold one man's baby while I cry for the man that I lost and the child I have who lost his father. Aaron's death anniversary this week can't just be a day I've set aside for remembering him quietly because I have a baby attached to my boobs. I want to give Aaron and his memory my best. I want to give this baby and this beautiful family my best. And sometimes I think my best is gone. And what is left is whoever I am now. So, enough about me. Let's talk about you, all of you, and how you're feeling. Our official season starts next week, November 28th. So go, have some turkey, have some stuffing, enjoy your families and your friends. And next week, we're getting into it. We've spent our summer with some amazing people around the country talking about life experiences and feelings, and I only cry in like 60% of the episodes. My stepmom called and she said, Michael's gone. And I was like, what do you mean Michael's gone? Everything was fine. But I just remember that that's what I did. Like I danced in my apartment as someone waited to hurt me. I asked the Lord every day to forgive me for wanting something bad to happen. Because I, as a Christian, shouldn't want that. But as a human, I do. How come some made it, some didn't? It hurts. It really does. Is there anything that makes that go away at all? No, ma'am. Not at all. If you want to talk to us, we are at TTFA Podcast on all the social media. You can hear everything from the upcoming season as it comes out by subscribing right now to Terrible Thanks for Asking on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm not here to tell you how to live your life. Our theme music is composed by the wonderful Joffrey Wilson. I will see you next week, but not really. It's in your ears. I'll see you next week. That's one of those things you just say and you're like, wait, I won't see anybody. I'm in a room talking to a microphone, and Hans, alone. Not to, like, I mean, break your suspension of disbelief, but we are not seeing each other right now. (sighs) 
How was that? <laughs>